a warm welcome to all of you to the 10-year celebration of Sharing is Caring. My name is Merete Sanderhoff and I work at SMK, the National Gallery of Denmark. Together with a bunch of great colleagues from the Danish cultural heritage sector, I started Sharing is Caring 10 years ago. And from the outset, Sharing is Caring was a community effort. This year, the Share Care team consists of great colleagues from the Royal Danish Library, the National Museum of Denmark and SMK. And my name is Christina Jensen. I'm a project manager and since 2016, I have been running the SMK Open project and developing a new online collection. Check it out at Open SMK DK. We have opened up the collection for almost 100,000 artworks together with 3D models, videos, audio files, and are planning to improve our communication about research and co conservation data with the use of IIIF. This conference also marks the end of the SMK Open project and the delivery of a more open SMK. SMK Open is generously supported by the Nadea Foundation. Yep, there's a lot to celebrate. We have 450 people attending from all over the world, from 40 countries on all continents except the Antarctica. From Denmark to Japan, from Cyprus to Iceland, New Zealand to Poland, Canada to Kenya, Brazil to Bulgaria, Spain to Ukraine, Belgium to Barbados. There are many old friends attending the conference, but there are actually 73% newcomers. A very warm welcome to all of you. Now, a little bit of the history of Sharing is Caring. Sharing is Caring started out in a think big, start small, move fast mindset. That was a phrase that was introduced to us by Michael Edson, our very first keynote speaker back in 2011. I'd been running a small pilot project on mutual image sharing between nine Danish art museums. That project gave birth to the idea to host a seminar for colleagues in the Danish glam sector to introduce and explore the international movement of open sharing that was taking place at the time. Every time we've held the conference, we've developed a specific theme we wanted to explore, from the technologies of sharing to crowdsourcing, remixing, and the impact of digitization. And five years into the life of Sharing it is Caring, it grew and became a platform for inspiration for communities also outside Denmark with the ShareCare X format and you'll hear much more about that in a minute. Sharing is Caring was always about the makers and doers. The theme for this year is to explore how open cultural heritage has been put to new use over the past 10 years and what we have ahead of us in terms of openness in the cultural heritage sector and in the world. And we want to explore what kind of difference it's making in broader, innovative and societal terms to work with this openness approach. Actually, the idea for the theme arose at the Sharing is Caring um, extension in Amsterdam in 2019, where an Ignite talk by a Swedish artist caught a lot of people's attention because he was using digitized cultural heritage actively to create new works. So, for this anniversary, we decided to fill the entire program with people who make a difference in the world by using open cultural heritage. In short, we want to celebrate all of you out there who create and build and innovate with Open Glam, along with the 10-year birthday of our little conference. <laughs> So this event will take place as a mix of pre-recorded talks and live debates, and we warmly encourage you to take active part in the discussions and conversations throughout. 
The program for today is packed with content. We start out with a share care tour of Europe where you'll hear more about this share care X when the conference uh, went outside Denmark's borders. Um, then we have a short break um, and then we move to the keynote uh, session. Um, the first one of this conference with Peter Kaufmann and Henriette Rode Conleff, followed by um, a conversation between the two. And here's where you all come in and can pose your questions in the Vimeo chat, etc. Then another comfort break, and then we move to the Ignite session, the first of two, where we look into explorative concepts together with four speakers. That's followed by an opportunity to chat with the Ignites again through the Vimeo chat. Then we wrap up the day. And tonight, there'll be a social session on Wonder Me hosted by Saskia Skelchens and Larissa Bork. Yeah. Let me just tell you a bit how to, you can take part in this conversation. I will monitor the chat that's placed just next to the, um, the video stream. So please post your questions and comments there. I already see a lot of highs and thanks for that. Uh, Merede will facilitate the conservations with the keynotes and ignites. So please don't hold back, but ask away and we'll do our best to bring forth as many as your questions as possible. If you want to pose a question or comment to a particular speaker, just mention the speaker's name along with the comment or question. And please keep a respectful tone and an open mind towards new fellow participants uh, when engaging in discussions. And I will keep time and tap Marita's shoulder if she loses time during the conversations. Thanks. I'm glad to have you, Christina, by my side. <laughs> now I'd like to introduce the Share Care Tour of Europe. We'll invite you on a tour of Europe, more precisely to four capitals where local GLAM communities have staged their own Sharing is Caring conferences uh, over the past five years. And the first we visit is Anche Schmidt in Hamburg, Anche is head of digital strategy at the Museum für Kunst und Gewerbe in Hamburg. And um, she was the first one to run with the Sharing is Caring format outside of Denmark. Welcome, Anche. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to this great, great um, anniversary of sharing is caring and um, congratulations to you and especially Mirete and many many hugs from Hamburg and yes I had the honor to co-organize and co-host the first sharing is caring extension in 2017 together with uh, Gertraud Koch and Samantha Lutz at the University of Hamburg. And it was actually a little bit like a crazy idea when um, I asked Merete in autumn 2016 um, if uh, how she thinks about the idea to extend this uh, idea of the sharing is caring format to other countries and to bring it to Germany because um, since we were the first art museum in Germany to have a public domain policy uh, which we established in 2015, we wanted to be an inspiration for others in Germany and to encourage them to follow our example. And therefore, it was really important and vital to show them that there is an international community behind this concept of open glam and a very important community because um, there are always people who support each other. And I think this is um, one of the best things that can happen. So um, we were very happy to have these um, important partners with the University of Hamburg and also very happy to 
um, get the opportunity to organize the conference because of Wikimedia Germany who supported us financially. And um, actually it was really fruitful to have a partner from um, not another institution, but also from another sector to have different perspectives on um, these concepts of open glam. And we were very, very happy that many speakers from all over the world um, followed um, us to support us at Sharing is Caring Extension. Even from New Zealand, we had the honor to um, welcome some guests. And you can uh, look up their important contributions and talks all on the Sharing is Caring website. But the most important thing I was, um, uh, I think was the thing going on behind the scenes. Many students were involved in the concept um, in this uh, preparing the Sharing is Caring extension in Germany. For example, also one of my students um, at the university, Larissa Borg, and um, you will get to know her this evening because she is hosting this very nice um, Wonder Me after party. So there is an ongoing uh, cooperation between the museums and the course museum management. And there's another wonderful project that actually also sparked from these ideas of sharing is caring and open glam uh, that we are having together with the National Museum in Stockholm and also the Übersee Museum in Bremen. And it's called Neo Collections where we still explore these concepts of openness, reuse and user-centered collections online further. And we really hope that you all be um, involved and that we could exchange on this in the future. Thank you very much and many congratulations. Thank you so much, Anche. It was really um, a great idea you got back then to uh, try to extend uh, sharing is caring uh, to anywhere that this concept can be used and um, uh, it's been really fascinating for us who started this uh, little conference back then in 2011 to see how it's grown. The next uh, community who um, responded to our open call to run your own Sharing is Caring conference was in Brussels, Belgium. And uh, I got an email from Sam Donville, um, who wanted to do something with uh, the local Open Glam community and Wikimedia. So over to you in Brussels, Sam. Thank you very much, Marietta. Uh, so the reason why we took Sharing is Caring up on their offer to organize a spin-off conference was that uh, just like in Hamburg, I suppose, that we f uh, felt that there wasn't really a focused Open Glam community in Belgium at the time. And we thought in order to get the general sentiment to tilt a bit more towards open glam practices, we needed to create more uh, awareness of existing work uh, of organizations in Belgium and abroad. And moreover, Sharing is Caring was already a, a bit of a brand and uh, which allowed us to de-emphasize maybe our own organization's view, uh, which at the time was maybe still somewhat of a fringe uh, position to take. So that was quite convenient for us, I think. And then, uh, yeah, we focused our event on uh, open glam practices on Wikimedia uh, platforms. Uh, because in the years uh, before the conference, we had already collaborated with the fine arts museums in Flanders to release their uh, metadata on Wikidata, for instance. Um, and we wanted to continue to build on uh, this precedent by also releasing um, the digital surrogates on Wikimedia Commons and then uh, combining them and linking them. But in 2017, however, the Flemish museums were still very much um, undecided uh, on where they stood in terms of uh, open data and releasing uh, digital surrogates of the institutions themselves. Oh, that was still pretty much unthinkable uh, because digitization was often premised on monetizing uh, the digital surrogates. 
So in order to prove uh, the value of releasing digital reproductions, we had to find a way to make them ourselves. And uh, that is why in 2016 and 2017, we organized a project called Wiki Loves Heritage, uh, a crowdsourced photography uh, project intended to generate freely licensed images of these artworks on Wikimedia Commons. And uh, these images would allow us to show the value of releasing uh, images at a time where museums themselves weren't really comfortable with it. And then after the project, uh, we had some leftover budget and the Wikimedia Foundation graciously agreed for us to use it uh, to fund our sharing is caring extension. And yeah, it would allow us to showcase not only the Wikilove's Heritage project, but also uh, to show the work of speakers in museums, archives and libraries in Belgium and abroad. Um, and since our sharing is caring extension, um, we have been trying to join other initiatives which uh, build a community around Open Glam. Uh, we have uh, since 2018 uh, taken the lead on organizing Public Domain Day in Belgium, for instance. And during this time, we have um, really uh, seen a pretty remarkable shift. Uh, so now releasing collection data is in no way considered controversial anymore. That's the first and uh, has found its way into both institutional and government uh, policy documents. And then slowly but surely also releasing the digital surrogates has become something that the institution themselves are uh, defending. Um, for instance, in 2019, the Flemish art museums published a joint statement um, of their intention to release all the uh, digital surrogates of uh, public domain works in their collections as uh, open content, basically. And also another thing I've noticed is in a recent um, uh, Wikimedia 20 year celebration, we were pleasantly surprised to see uh, many people, institutions to making, make time in the end of their day to join this communi uh, community to show their own projects um, and uh, really see community and, and uh, talk to the reusers themselves um, to sort of move uh, forward. Um, and yeah, we see Wikimedia and open data uh, in general mentioned in many project proposals uh, that come our way. And uh, many heritage institutions are making use of the trainings and resources that we have provided for them. So voila, that's our little story arc, I suppose. Um, so only thing left for me to say is uh, congratulations for uh, 10 years of sharing is caring. And uh, back to you, uh, May. Thank you for um, having been part of the history of this. Um, this is, uh, as I started out uh, saying in the introduction, a real community effort. And I think it's been heartwarming uh, to follow uh, how everyone from around um, museums, libraries, uh, and archives have wanted to come together to um, change uh, the ways we used to work together. Um, the next speaker that's uh, on here, uh, who has held a Sharing is Caring extension, is uh, from Sweden. It's uh, Karin Glasermann, who is digital coordinator at the Swedish National Museum, who has also done uh, amazing work to open up the cultural uh, and artistic heritage of Sweden. So please, over to you. Thank you, Marietta. Um, was, am I there? I can still just see you. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Right. So I was going to start with um, the fact that 10 years of sharing is caring is really a fantastic legacy because what Sam said is uh, very much true as well for Sweden that right now the um, fact to share your collections openly are not at all controversial anymore for most institutions. But I remember following one of the very first conferences in 2013 or 14, and I remember how a lot of the topics that were presented and discussed seemed really like science fiction to me. So uh, sharing collections for free for all seemed to be an impossible thought at our institution at that time. And the fact that we, as National Museum of Sweden, together with our fantastic partners, that 
uh, National Historical Museums and the National Heritage Board in 2013 indeed organized our own Sharing is Caring event um, is for me actually the, the most certain evidence for how impactful this conference there is, have been and, and still are. Because it was through this community effort, through the community that this conference series actually hold together that we uh, were guided on the way towards our um, decision to actually open up the collections. And what is a conference series if not for the people who keep it alive? So first and foremost, I would like to thank founder and all-time star Marita Sandov, who with her unmatched capacity to really involve everyone in the discussion and to make difficult decisions make seem so incredibly simple has actually guided a lot of institutions, I think, on the way to more openness, especially with this conference series. Um, when I asked my uh, teammates who organized this conference in 2019 with me, like what would we want to highlight from our 2019 event? Um, we all said like, yeah, it was so fantastic. We could hug each other and we were together in the same room and we ate this good food together. Um, but of course, sharing the sh all the sharing is caring events have brought together people who think about the same issues and struggle with similar problems. And I think what makes it so extraordinary is that people are so ever so generous with offering their help and guidance and um, support, whatever you are struggling with in your institution. So in our event, we decided to focus on the end user as well. Uh, our, our conference was called Open Data Now What? Um, <clears throat> and we tried to highlight how to actually include principles of open glam into the institution's everyday work after the main decision has been made. And in true sharing is caring spirit, something that stuck with all of us was the insight that maybe it's not always so important that we as institutions are there and doing things with our material. But what is even more important is what other people might start with the open collections. So all my organizing teammates actually um, asked me to focus on one presentation that stuck with all of this um, then in 2019, which is the presentation by Andre Tarashuk, who flew in all the way from Colorado to Stockholm to present to us his universe of art sharing social media bots. And Andre had no affiliation to museums whatsoever, just an interest in art and the desire to make social media more beautiful. Up to this day, he has used his skills to program social media bots that might share art from a, speci from a specific artist or from a specific collection. And while I don't know how many bots exactly there are, I can tell you, <clears throat> I just got the stats last week, that those bots have until now um, more than 10 and a half million followers. They have shared almost 5 million different artworks, generated 56 million likes and only uh, almost 17 million retweets. And on Twitter alone, they have generated 1 billion impressions. So I had this sign that I was gonna show you, but it doesn't work with the uh, virtual background. 1 billion is a one with nine zeros, it's a thousand millions. So, this is talking about uh, reaching a diverse audience out of the museum's walls without um, very much input from the museum other than making your collections openly available. So if you're feeling gloomy about that we're not able to hug each other like it was like 2019, just do yourself a favor and brighten up your social media feed by looking up Andre's work, find your favorite artist or collection and follow them. And with that, and a big thank you and a big, big virtual hug back to you, Noretta. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Hugs back at you, <laughs> all of you. Um, yeah, Andre's work is amazing. And um, as I also said in the introduction, it was exactly speakers like Andre and the other creatives who we've seen at uh, the conferences over the years that inspired us to just jam-pack the program this year with people who create 
with our collections. We think it's, it's so inspiring and uh, we'll hear a lot of that um, over the next uh, two days. So another colleague who knows a lot about having a big collection that's being used worldwide is, last but not least, Saskia Skalchens, who is Head of Research Services at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Welcome, Saskia. Hi, Marita. Um, and the points go to um, Marita and the uh, Sharing is Caring team. <laughs> Uh, it sounds like, a, it, it, it feels like a Eurovision, uh, uh, George Oates uh, uh, mentioned in the chat, and, and it does. And I think uh, it says everything about the warm relationships that you uh, created and uh, uh, related and connected a lot of people. So thank you a lot. Um, so hello from Amsterdam. Um, on the 22nd of in um, November uh, 2019, uh, we also had the honor and the pleasure to also organize a Sharing is Caring X event in the Rijksmuseum. Um, about 100 people from the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, the UK and the US attended the one day conference. I had the pleasure of working together with an organizing committee with members from my department that you can see over here. Uh, and I'm sure um, that they are attending uh, this conference as well. Um, if you want to know more about the events or the topics that we dealt with, um, you can, uh, don't hesitate to contact me or any other member of the organizing committee, and we will be glad to share any information uh, of what we have. The Rijksmuseum, uh, of course, is known for its open data policy which a former colleague of ours, uh, Lizzie Jongma, who now no longer works at the Rijksmuseum, passionately defended and promoted together with the help of Europeana uh, in the years before I started in 2016. The story by now is known to many in the digital cultural heritage world, how the museum was closed for renovation for 10 long years and how the collection and the building triumphantly reopened in 2012-13. Also in that year, the then new collection interface of the museum called Reich Studio uh, was launched, in which a general audience could browse, search and engage with the object collection at a very direct level. Most of the then digitized artworks at the start about 250,000, but by now more than 700,000 objects could be downloaded for free at a fairly high resolution together with its metadata, be it on a one-on-one -on -one basis or in bulk via a live API. Almost all objects of the collection are, and will continue to be, released under a CC0. So they are, and they will remain in the public domain, free for everyone to use, even if one or more persons decides to make an NFT out of it. Flash forward to 2019, and the, conf and the topic of the organizing committee, the organizing committee decided on the Sharing is Caring X conference in Amsterdam was Fair Glam. Um, Fair is an acronym which comes from the world of open science, and which stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. It is being used to describe the needs and requirements of scientific data in a scholarly world. We very much felt that this concept can also be applied to cultural heritage data and that a nuance of that concept reflects the nuance that is now needed to take another step forward within the open GLAM community. A binary approach, open or closed, doesn't reflect the challenges and the complexities of digital cultural heritage data any longer. In the Rijksmuseum, but I'm sure the same goes for other museums, we have a growing collection of all sorts of collection data, of which the fastest growing part is without any doubt research data. For example, chemical paint analysis, text corpora, scans, 3D scans, provenance data, but also digital museum publications, a national art library collection, a large museum archive, documentation, 
data from social media channels and educational data, to name but a few. Together, we can use it to tell rich and more complex stories about a collection, allowing us to connect to all kinds of audiences with all kinds of stories from all kinds of different perspectives. The fair glam concept allows us to think about how to openly share this multiverse in a more diverse and sustainable way. At the conference in 2019, we arranged the talk so that they would elaborate the different concepts of the FAIR acronym. What I originally wanted to do was give an update of how far we have come with implementing a FAIR data policy in the Rijksmuseum. But I've been talking for quite a long time, so I don't think there's time to do that. Let me only say that we are working hard to implement the infrastructure and working processes to make such an extended open data policy a fair data policy possible. Last but not least, I want to invite you to all, to all this evening and tomorrow evening to a social media meet, meeting place after the lectures. Larissa Borg and I have taken the initi initiative to set up a sharing is caring room in Wonder, on Wonder Me, a social platform that allows people to communicate with each other in an easy and intuitive way without the need to register or open up an account. We thought that it was important to allow people to meet each other and share what they have heard during the day. I'm a firm believer of the idea that innovation comes through conversation and dialogue. So check your mail with the link to the Wonder Me platform. And if you haven't received the link, don't hesitate to DM me or Larissa via Twitter and join us tonight at 8 p.m. or tomorrow at 5, Copenhagen time. Enjoy the conference. Thanks so much, Saskia. Um, again, it's, um, it's quite wonderful to see this community stepping up because, um, you know, apart from uh, running uh, the conference uh, in uh, other European uh, countries, um, we also got this call just a few evenings ago um, from Saskia and Larissa saying, hey, uh, would you like us to set up a social space? Um, we think it's maybe missing in the, in the conference program and opportunity for uh, all of uh, you participants uh, to network like we're used to when we get together for um, real life conferences. And uh, Christina and I had been so busy uh, together with the rest of the organizing team, just getting all of the practical details together. So it was like um, an orange in our turban that fell down so that um, we could do some more sociable uh, stuff together with you with the help from the community. So thanks so much, Saskia and Larissa. It was just what was needed for this uh, conference. So thanks a lot, Saskia and Larissa. Yeah. And uh, we'll get back to the practical details about the evening session uh, before we end this day. To round off this session um, about the, um, the Sharing is Caring uh, extensions, uh, I'd just like to tell all of you that if you have an idea for a conference on the topic of Open Glam, you can run your own Sharing is Caring too. So please feel free to get in touch with me at M. Sanderhoff or I'm easy to find uh, my email, etc. And um, the Sharing is Caring X presenters that you just met to learn more. Um, and uh, now it's time for a quick uh, comfort break, just five minutes. Uh, you can stock up on coffee and uh, sit down a little bit, rest, um, and we'll be back at uh, 2.40. See ya.
and welcome back from this short comfort break. Um, it's time to move to the, you can say, the heart of the conference. We have um, four keynote speakers this year, and uh, the first two of them will present this afternoon. Um, they have pre-recorded their videos so that we were sure that everything would work. Um, but after we play these two talks, uh, you'll be able to meet them live for a keynotes in conversation. The first keynote is Peter P. Kaufman. He's a writer, teacher and documentary producer. His hot off the press book, The New Enlightenment and the Fight to Free Knowledge, is our formal excuse for having him here to open Sharing is Caring 2021. But we've followed his work for many years and been deeply influenced by it. Peter co-wrote the seminal white paper, The Problem of the Yellow Milkmaid, together with Europeana's Harry Favine and Kenneth Lund's Martijn um, Arnoldus back in 2011 which made many of us realize the futility of trying to keep our digitized collections restricted from the internet public. Peter works at MIT Open Learning and the Knowledge Futures Group, but his real pas passion lies elsewhere. It's literature, and not just any old book. He serves as a member of the Editorial Advisory Board of the Russian Library, an initiative based at Columbia University Press to bring out more Russian literature into English because, as Peter says, Russian literature is the only thing that matters. Please welcome Peter Kaufman. Hagen this way, uh, into your screens this way. Um, if not in the other way, we're more used to. Uh, this conference means a lot to me, its subject uh, and its focus, uh, but also because the name of it involves some good English wordplay. Sharing is caring. Okay, let me add that sharing, uh, the way we uh, all mean it, is not the default position for a lot of people. It's not the way they think. So sharing is an act of bravery. It's an act of courage. Sharing is daring. Uh, you know also that sharing involves uh, a lot of mistakes. We've been at it for one, two decades only. Uh, frankly, it involves a lot of experiments, some of which go wrong. Uh, so sharing is Airing. Sharing is full of challenges. Uh, it can be exhausting. Sharing, ladies and gentlemen, sharing is wearing. And because so much leadership um, comes from the Netherlands, I love the writing and other work I've been able to do there with Harry Ferwayen at Europeana. Uh, for example, Johan Uman at Sound and Vision. Um, and others, uh, it seems, you know, that I'm always hungry when I'm there. Uh, so I want to say that sharing is also, I want to say that sharing is herring, but that would be ridiculous. Let me make five points about our responsibilities right now. <clears throat> the first is we are at peak information disorder today. We have an epistemic disorder, what some people here describe as truth decay. Just over half of the people who live in the United States believe in angels. Okay, uh, just under half the country here believes in evolution, uh, which when you, you look around sometimes, you know, if you go to Washington and look at, you know, some of our political leaders, you do wonder, but uh, more seriously uh, and egregiously, we are in crisis. We have more than half a million people dead because they didn't believe in science 
because people they listened to flouted it and disregarded it uh, and attacked it. We've caused so much of the damage around the world by circulating and allowing false information uh, to circulate that shame should hang on us from now to the end of time. We also have people dead, killed by others, uh, attacked, dead at their own hand, injured for life, uh, all in political rioting in our capital because thousands and thousands of us didn't believe, circulated big lies, accusing victors in free elections of cheating and stealing. We are in the greatest economic crisis uh, of our lives because again, the, the pandemic has as its twin an infodemic. We have to fix it. The second point is we've seen this before. Unfortunately, it was called the Dark Ages. I've just written a book which opens with a guy, he became famous, uh, opens with him getting strangled and a guy getting burned at the stake uh, in an auto de fe. It's the same guy. Actually, they're trying to strangle him and then they light him on fire or the other way around as one does in the 16th century <laughs> over there. Um, it happened to him because he wanted to share knowledge. He was the uh, original sharer, carer, darer. The book opens in the 16th century. Um, William Tyndall uh, was his name. And his thing was to translate the Bible so people could read it and hear it in ways that the apparatus of the crown and the apparatus of the church did not want it read and did not want it heard. I will cause a boy that driveth the plow, he told the priest, shall know more of the scripture than thou dost. Uh, worship back then was like television, but television and newspapers and magazines and the web all together once a week. It was like listening to my talk today and maybe one or two others, but that's all you had for media, God forbid, for representing the outside world for the week. I'd be here at a pulpit reading stuff to you, uh, not, not from my book, but from a book that looked like, you know, uh, this uh, and no other book every week. If it were my book, that would be great for sales. But no, uh, actually, uh, you could not have your own copy of that other book. You could not buy it. You could not own it, uh, not in the original languages, and especially not in a language like English that you could understand. No, another guy uh, in Tyndall's time gets burnt at the stake also for having the Lord's Prayer in English written on a scrap of paper in his pocket. Anyway, I would be here reading this thing to you, but I would be lying. It would be like you were watching me, but I were Fox News. I would be saying, you have to give money to me. Otherwise, you won't get into heaven. You have to do this. You have to do penance. When the word in the Bible actually originally was to repent, you have to do that. You have to engage in charity. When the Greek word originally actually meant to love. For confess, which is what the church wanted, Tyndall gave us the simpler, more personal, more accurate translation to acknowledge. Tyndall was a genius. Uh, ultimately, his work with the Bible gave the English language as many idioms and phrases as Shakespeare. Um, he knew seven languages, Greek, Latin, Hebrew, Aramaic. He was completely devout. In fact, when he's in jail, he converts his jailer and his jailer's whole family uh, in Antwerp. Uh, anyway, this system of lies and toxic information, he uh, would have none of it. Uh, so he wades through the entire Bible, from Genesis 1 through Revelation 22, not only owning the thing, upon pain of death, 
translating the thing upon pain of death, but printing and distributing the translations upon pain of death. And he worked with all the publishing technologies of his day, connecting personally with book designers, paper suppliers, printers, boat captains, horsemen across 16th century Europe, the YouTubes, the websites, the Twitters back then. And he brings the knowledge and the book that contains it into the hands of the people. They chased him down and they killed him for it. So the battle of knowledge against ignorance, truth versus lies, is not new. And if you're a curator or a librarian or a professor or an archivist or an author or bookseller or publisher, you're involved in it. But if you start professing the wrong things, the wrong kinds of things, if you start curating publishing, you know, about the Nakba in Palestine, for example, or publishing the wrong things about the fact that our military shoots and burns civilians in our name, or the fact that our government and communications companies can track and share every move we make, which is true, or you try to make all the academic and scholarly journals, some of them decades old, freely shareable, free to the world, or if you, you know, are in another country like Alexei Navalny and start publishing truths about Russian government and church corruption, the forces that exist will come for you. They will track you down. They will drive you into exile or madness or prison or worse. So we all need some courage when we share because we are doing the right thing. The third point, we've been let out of this kind of darkness before. It was called the Enlightenment. Newton's physics, uh, Montesquieu's laws, Linnaeus's taxonomies, Rousseau's political philosophy, the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Uh, most of it happened on the continent, although we had a couple good years. At the heart of that whole project, there was perhaps no greater offering to truth and reason than the 22 million word, 22 million word encyclopedie that the French Enlightenment philosophers started writing, compiling, and offering to the public in 1750. Something of a miracle, not just from a content assembly perspective, an effort to gather all the world's knowledge and print and publish it, but also from a socio-political one, given all the powerful forces suppressing knowledge that such an effort at that time would provoke. The encyclopedia found the state and the church banning at one time or another, almost every one of its 72,000 articles, 18,000 pages, 28 volumes, and invoking a hundred ways to forbid its distribution. The act of doing this to compile all the world's knowledge and pack it into one place that could be published, distributed, shared, was mind blowing. But so was what was inside. The encyclopedia smote all the 18th century orthodoxies. No proposition can be accepted as a divine revelation, they wrote in the article on reason. If it contradicts what is known to us, either by immediate intuition as in the case of self-evident propositions or by obvious deductions of reason. It would be ridiculous to give press preference to such revelations. The entry for fortune spotlighted the gross inequalities of wealth already evident in 18th century Europe. In the article on the slave trade, they wrote, and this is the 1750s, mind you, the purchase of Negroes to reduce them into slavery violates all religion morals, natural law, and human rights. But even more, the encyclopedist announced from day one that their giant project would be, as we say today, fact-based. How? There would be uh, an underlying and overarching commitment to the verification of all source materials. Verification is a long and painful process, Diderot wrote in his uh, 
introduction to the whole enterprise, the famous preliminary discourse. We have tried as much as possible to avoid this inconvenience, he said then, by citing directly in the body of the articles the authors on whose evidence we have relied and by quoting their own text when it is necessary. What this meant in practice was revolutionary. There would be no accepted truths but for those that could be proven and cited. So where does your work, our work, the stuff we have to share, and the ways in which we share it fit in to the life cycle of fact-based knowledge? I think verification is a key to getting us out of this mess. Diderot's commitment to reference, to citation, to verification continues in the Enlightenment's most important successor project, Wikipedia, founded by Jimmy Wales and his colleagues 20 years ago this year. It's the foundation of what today's Wikipedia terms verifiability. And in many key ways, once again, it is likely to be the foundation for truth in knowledge and society today. Verification, Wikipedia writes in its statement of policies, means that material added to Wikipedia must have been published previously by a reliable source. Editors may not add their own views to articles simply because they believe them to be correct and may not remove sources views from articles simply because they disagree with them. Verifiability is a necessary condition, a minimum requirement for the inclusion of material, though it is not a sufficient condition. It may not be enough. Wikipedia, of course, is one of the world's most popular websites, uh, the world's most popular non-commercial one, and an irreplaceable source of verifiable information open to any and all. The Internet Archive is another. It's actually working together with Wikipedia now digitizing books so that links to sources in Wikipedia link all the way through to the book themselves, the books themselves and render images and text on the cited pages. So a Wikipedia article on Martin Luther King Jr. for example, in such an article the reference link to a biography of Reverend King by Taylor Branch now hot links to the entire readable book online. That work is essential. Can we take verifiability further now, especially as our epistemic crisis deepens? Information about vaccines, literally a pox on our house now, about elections. Can we improve citation for the medium that's beginning to overtake us all, which is video? Can we make resources on the web verifiable? What is a citation like what does it sound like in a, in a podcast? It's super important. The use of footnotes and the research techniques associated with them, as Princeton's great historian Anthony Grafton writes, makes it possible to resist the efforts of modern governments, tyrannical and democratic alike, to conceal the compromises that they have made, the deaths they have caused, the tortures they and their allies have inflicted which takes us kind of back to where we started. My fourth point and most important point, um, consider the things we wanna share, the direct objects of what we are sharing. The image of an artwork, uh, a photo, a manuscript, a musical score, metadata, an artifact, a wall card, a museum catalog, sounds, moving images, property. Uh, that's the term we use for it, in intellectual property. The copyright law that first came around to describe all this stuff, the statute of Queen Anne, also came around during the Enlightenment. At the same time as Montesquieu and Rousseau and Jefferson were getting busy, and at the same time as Isaac Newton was formulating his laws of motion while observing apples uh, while at home in his orchard during a plague like this one we're having. And just as Newton figured out that apples fell to the ground, ultimately because of gravity and the laws of motion, so the people who wrote Queen Anne's law and most of the laws that have followed recognize that when all is said and done, 
when all the licenses have expired. An idea, a human creation, art, culture, science, also fall by their nature into the public domain. There's a physics of intellectual property, which I talk about a bit in here, uh, that should give us some hope. There's a natural order to things, the state of nature of all the things that we curate, perhaps, is ultimately the commons. Sometimes we just have to give it a little push to get it there. And let me close uh, in that light to say, fifth and finally, we have a, a real, really important uh, and new responsibility now to make knowledge, real knowledge, verifiable, verified information as viral as the lies that we read and hear today. We have to band together all of our knowledge institutions. There is no different uh, to a Visigoth, a Vandal, a Hun, or to a Viking between a museum curator and a librarian or an archivist or professor or public radio producer. We are all of these things. In fact, we are all public broadcasters now because of the uh, medium of the internet. That, that's our, our disposal. We have to re-examine our terms of service agreements with the technologies we use, with the publishers and producers we work with, and especially with our constituents, wherever uh, we are, wherever they are. We have to create some new covenants with our readers, with our visitors, with our viewers. The old social contract that we have uh, articulated by Rousseau and all these guys, uh, that contract, that general contract is tearing. And I hope that we can find uh, some way to be sharing with some daring when we're caring the next time that we all meet in person. Um, in the meantime, thanks for the opportunity to share some thoughts um, with you. Uh, thanks for the time again and over uh, to you. Thank you, Peter, for opening this conference with um, opening up to the wider society and uh, the times we live in and uh, how our sector, the cultural heritage sector, can think and do into that situation. The next keynote is Henriette Rode Conliffe. She is an associate professor in digital humanities at the University of Copenhagen. With a background in archaeological computing and a doctorate examining digital tools for the reading of historic texts, her research is primarily in the use of data and digital tools within heritage. She has adapted this knowledge to teaching digital heritage and data science in the humanities, as well as sharing tutorials online. Her theoretical, empirical and applied research has resulted in the book Open Heritage Data, an introduction to research, publishing and programming with open data in the heritage sector from last year. And this book is an important basis for the keynote today that she's giving. Like Peter, her talents are also profuse check out her beautiful fabric designs, of course, based on open cultural heritage on Spoonflower. But first, let's give it up for Henriette's keynote. Hello, um, my name is Henriette Rode Cunliffe, and I am very honored and very happy to present this keynote at uh, this Sharing is Caring anniversary. I am an associate professor in digital humanities at the University of Copenhagen. And I recently published a book on open heritage data that in part is the foundation of my talk today. Introducing open data in the glam sector means that the mediation of heritage is not the sole privilege of these institutions anymore. In theory, anyone anywhere can use heritage material that is fully open for any purpose. However, in practice, this has not happened to the degree that many in the open glam community had hoped and that others had perhaps feared. 
While researching for my book, The Use of Years of Digitization, an online publication with various degrees of openness, I've discovered a lot to celebrate, as well as issues that continue to stand in the way of incorporating open glam in education, in creativity and in research. Today I want to share with you first a celebration of the journey that we as a community have taken towards openness. And then, as with any good critique sandwich, I will add some filling in the form of a discussion of two important issues that I believe we need to tackle going forward. And finally, I'll introduce you to some of the continued research uh, that I'm doing in order to discover a broader understanding of these issues, as well as a path towards solutions. In my book, I introduce openness as a journey that GLAM institutions have taken throughout their history. Before we had the institutions themselves, we had amateurs in the sense that they were self-funded and didn't have formal training in the field. And these amateurs collected, curated and sometimes published about heritage. This early heritage work was shared through family and other close ties. And in order to take part, you had to have your own means of funding. Later, this evolved into the institutions that we know today. We have a certain sense of when these institutions began, but this is solely based on our knowledge of institutionalization in richer parts of the world. And even here, we sometimes see that part of our heritage is still only shared through amateur networks, particularly if it's not deemed to reflect dominant culture or thoughts. However, with these institutions come funding and an increased education of a professional sphere of heritage workers who could technically come from any layer of society. These institutions also open up some of their collections physically for the public to see. Here we have to keep in mind though uh, that physical access still provides some barriers. The main one being that curation and access is often limited to mainstream narratives. Most institutions have a lot more material than they could ever give public access to physically. Also, even to visit the institution, to see what is readily available is not an option for everyone. The web has given us amazing possibilities to open up access, potentially to anyone with an internet connection which again, we often forget, not everyone has. But too often it's been in the form of a look but don't touch digital publication. So again, it's a huge step in openness, but it still leaves us with many obstacles. This is where open data and the idea of open glam comes in. This makes heritage and cultural material available in such a way that anyone with a stable internet connection can access, use, and repurpose our common heritage in its different formats for the purposes that they choose. Be it for family history, for creative face masks, or for a gaming app that they can earn money of. This is, the, this is currently the frontier of openness. And over the last 10 years, we've seen more and more institutions that have joined this path. However, despite these great optics, there are still varying degrees of openness out there. In the book, I set about to create a model that can be used to evaluate this degree of openness. And I want to introduce this model to you with examples of various institutions and how they're tackling these elements. The model contains five levels or questions, if you will. And the first asks if the material is published online with metadata so that it can be searched and filtered. Metadata, for those who are not aware, is the data about data. So information such as title, creator, date, and more. The Arab Image Foundation in Lebanon is an example of this, where the site displays uh, Middle Eastern heritage photographs together with metadata such as uh, photographer, uh, dates, subjects, uh, and more that can that can be searched. The second question asks whether the material is published with an open license or in the public domain. Uh, 
and whether this is clearly communicated in conjunction with the material. Wien Museum in Austria is a new example of this. They've recently made over 50,000 images and items available in their collections portal. Most of them as open content. It is very clear in their interface how to filter for this open content. And when you navigate to the individual items, the license or copyright information is clearly indicated. The third question asks whether the institution actively encourages reuse of the material and provides support for anyone who wishes to use it free of charge. Lake Studio at the Rijksmuseum in the Netherlands is a great example of an, an institution encouraging reuse. For each artwork, uh, this is clear with buttons like download this uh, work and get creative or order this work as a poster or a canvas. On top of this, they occasionally host the Rijks Studio Awards, which is a design competition where they invite everyone to create their own masterpiece inspired by the Rijks Museum collection. The fourth question asks whether material is available in an open machine readable format that anyone can download. To exemplify this, I'll go back to an archaeological favor of mine, the portable antiquity scheme in England and Wales. The site enables and encourages the recording of archaeological objects found by members of the public and today contains information about uh, one and a half million objects. Many of these are found through metal detecting work and uh, field walking. The site allows users to download records individually or in bulk, as well as uh, encouraging and promoting research using the scheme's data set. So far, a total of 779 projects are registered with the site, ranging from personal projects uh, through student projects to major research projects. Finally, the last question asks if the material is available through a well-described API that anyone has access to. API or application programming interface is a technology where you through the web can send a request straight to a database, for example, as a URL, and receive up to date versions of the request in a in data format that you can use for programming or for data science. I want to exemplify this with the Trove site hosted by the National Library of Australia, where you can explore collections from Australian GLAM institutions and universities. Trove has an API which is well documented and available for registered users. And previous Trove manager Tim Shirt has done a lot of work on tutorials that show how to engage with this API, which is also a, a great starting point for heritage data science, something that I've also been testing with my own stu uh, students in the humanities faculty. So this is the journey so far. Douglas McCarthy and Dr. Andrea Wallace have compiled a list of nearly a thousand GLAM institutions across approximately 50 countries, making open data available in various ways. This is indeed something to celebrate. But now for the more critical filling of my sandwich. While we should celebrate the journey so far, we must also remember that three quarters of the world's countries are not represented on the list. And in the countries that are on the list, there are many, many institutions that are also not a part of this journey. Often it is only larger national institutions that are. There are still many hurdles that stand in the way of open data in the GLAM sector. Among them are the obvious issues of copyright, data protection, and the potential loss of revenue. Others are more vague, uh, such as just not seeing the need for open data or digital access. For example, the belief that physical access meets most needs and that only local people have an interest in your collection. Also the fear of misuse or just an alternative use that doesn't fit mainstream history or the institution's chosen narrative is a theme.
However, today I want to focus on two issues that I believe we desperately need to tackle in future. The first is fear. One thing I often encounter is the fear of legal difficulties, which I found to be more of a deterrent than the actual uh, leg legislation itself. Many are afraid of getting it wrong and of the consequences that could follow from this. And this fear leaks through to the potential users and has uh, many repercussions for uh, creativity and innovation. The fear often stems from lack of knowledge and experience, as well as a lack of policy and support from above. And when I say from above, I mean in different contexts. Within the individual organization, this could be a lack of support from management. And within a wider context, this could be a lack of uh, guidelines or policy from government and, and uh, from government agencies and politicians. And this leads to fear and uncertainty about how to practice open data uh, across the whole sector. Uh, the other issue I want to discuss is a desperate lack of active users for these digital tools and open collections. I would, for example, argue that open data projects won't survive without an active user base. I predict that it will be more and more difficult to motivate funding for projects that do not have this user base. And the projects that are already funded will not be maintained when the initial funding runs out. In the digital humanities, the sure and certain death of digital projects is a well-known problem. And I would argue that it is a natural consequence of projects which have never been developed for well-known and active uh, user groups or perhaps in the worst case, have been developed for a small group of researchers who probably could have done the work in a cloud-based system. Now, this may sound a little bit harsh, and therefore I want to um, exemplify it with some of my own sometimes failed projects. So eight years ago, I developed a few online tools and collections, uh, two of which I would like to compare here today. The first was a tool for the knitting community, and the second was a tool for researchers reading ancient documents. The first tool, uh, the, the knitting tool, works just as well today as when I uh, first developed it. Sure, there have been issues along the way that I've had to fix, but at least I knew exactly when the issues occurred and I was strongly motivated to fix them because there was this constant group of knitters using the tool who would contact me at once when they experienced problems with it. This was not my experience with the other tool, which gave access to transcriptions uh, of the Vindalanda tablets from Hadrian's Wall in the UK. I developed this as a part of my PhD with some quite nifty search options, if I say so myself. And uh, in the 10 years that passed, I've only had one email about it. At that point, it wasn't really working anymore, and I have very little motivation to fix it, even if I could access it again. This is simply because it wasn't built to be actively used uh, by a clear group of people. And this is not because there aren't users out there who actively seek heritage data, because there is. At the moment, a couple of colleagues and I are studying Danish family historians and their online behavior. They use a variety of different tools and collections, most of which are not built by GLAM institutions. Instead, they're built by family historians wanting to help each other and themselves, as well as private companies looking uh, to profit from this enormous interest in and use of heritage data. So far, I and others have, have focused greatly on understanding what institutions do and how they do it, what they publish online and how they go about it. But again, if we look around us in the heritage community, there are still very few institutions who are actively engaging in open data, who are trying to open their collections to use and reuse online. They are so few that we still meet them with a social media fanfare each time 
a new resource announces its arrival in the Open GLAM community. Above, I describe some of the issues that we face with open data. And based on that, I argued that the biggest issue is still that we're not quite sure what this open data can be used for and how we engage with and encourage people who might want to use it. This is why my research going forward will focus more on understanding the potential active use of open GLAM collections. On the one hand, I'm using a practice-based autoethnographic study, putting myself in the user's place and experiencing first and foremost how it is to use uh, open data uh, from GLAM institutions. How easy is it to get started? What are the tripping points? What makes me hesitant and fearful? The idea here is to explore these different issues by taking active part in these communities. For many collections, use is still so limited that a more exploratory research is a necessary starting point. However, simultaneous steps include studying a larger community of people who are using heritage data online. For example, through the project Family History Online, which I mentioned earlier. Perhaps through them we can learn how to create sustainable and actively useful open GLAM collections. For this practice-based autoethnographic study, I've thrown myself onto two different types of research of GLAM collections. The first is something that I have been uh, doing and teaching for years, namely testing and showcasing how and what can be done with the most open collections according to the model I discussed earlier. I simply test and create tutorials showing how to use uh, GLAM APIs on my blog. The example here shows a few visualizations and initial analysis of 19th century Danish dog protocols with the most popular dog names, uh, breeds and colors. While testing and explaining my process in a tutorial aimed at people in the heritage sector with fewer technical skills, I have a few preliminary thoughts. The first is that there is a huge gap in the market for real beginners introductions to data science and programming for adults. Beginners material uh, aimed at adults usually presume that these adults already have uh, a technical understanding. So it's not really beginners material at all. The only true beginners material that is available uh, seems to be the, th the things that are aimed at children. Um, this includes information on how to find a platform or environment to, to work in, uh, how to get started with programming, for example, with very simple steps. The second thing is that uh, open GLAM APIs are not in general well documented. If there is documentation at all, you often need a substantial technical background to understand it. I think this is very much a consequence uh, of what I was talking about earlier, this lack of users and, and lack of actual use. The other type of reuse of open GLAM that I am, I'm trying to practice uh, is found in the creative sphere. Imagine if more people could use GLAM material creatively while interpreting our culture or simply learning from the past in the way that the Rijksmuseum is encouraging. I'm trying this by using collections with openly licensed or public domain images to create new artwork that I can get printed on fabric, wallpaper, cups, and much more. This is again also a work in progress, but I have some preliminary thoughts here too. The first is that many online collections are very difficult to search, either because images are not tagged for creative findability, or because there's too much other material in the portal which is not relevant for this type of use. Secondly, in the creative community, licensing and copyright is scary stuff. Uh, many people are up in arms because they daily experience or hear about someone whose designs have been stolen. At the same time, there's a lot of focus on original designs. And we also have commercial companies and even glam institutions who give off the idea that they own copyright uh, of heritage images 
or material when, when it's actually unclear whether they do. And all of this, of course, occurs online where there are a lot of different opinions and tensions often rise very quickly. All in all, it is very, it's very scared, very easy to get scared in this environment. And fear is a definite killer of innovation and creativity. Uh, for my own part, not a week seems to go by where I don't want to throw in the towel and say I'll never uh, do any creative reuse again. Um, and in this atmosphere, it doesn't help that the institutions holding these collections are also afraid. Instead, they need to communicate clearly that they encourage and value creative reuse of their collections, also for commercial purposes. So this was a short introduction to how I'm going forward in my research on open data and GLAM. I hope that we can uh, continue to both celebrate the journey uh, that, that we've taken so far, but also continue an open and critical discussion of how we can include more GLAM institutions, more active users, uh, more diverse narratives, as well as tackle uh, the fear going forward uh, in open GLAM. Thank you. Thank you, Henriette. Um, I think your uh, two perspectives on the topic of open GLAM and what it can do in the world um, complement each other so well. So I really wanted to bring you into a room together um, for a conversation today and I'm very happy to have you here, albeit in a virtual room. I'd like to start uh, with um, a question for both of you, um, a very open, big question. Um, and while I give you this question, uh, I'd like to also just uh, repeat to all of you out there who are listening and watching that we are very happy to take all of your questions during these uh, conversation sessions. So please just overwhelm Christina on the chat. Um, she'll tap my shoulder when um, I can bring your questions in. So, Henriette and Peter. We live in an era where an astounding amount of people from street level to governments disregard scientific facts. The very basis of what we work with in a heritage and knowledge institutions. What can cultural heritage institutions do to fight that trend? Hmm. <laughs> That's a big question. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Um, I don't know if you want to start out, Peter. Uh, you wrote I'll the talk book. To you. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to happy to go second on this one. <laughs> you have to um, help us here. <laughs> yes. Well, that is indeed a big question. I I think I do think openness is to an extent. Um, the solution. Uh, I think it is difficult today. I, I have thought a lot about this because um, we have so, I think one of the things that we do also see uh, with, with the science that is more visible today uh, for everyone is that there are different, uh, different versions. There are different, uh, which is not to say that all versions are equally good, but they are just different versions. Um, as a researcher, I know first and foremost that I don't agree with all my colleagues on everything. We don't. That is part of the, the scientific process also, to be curious and to be open to, uh, to new ideas. And um, so I think transparency is, is one of the sort of key things I, I um, appreciate in research that people are transparent about what they do and I think that's where institutions who have a material data available that they can share they come in because that is a part of the whole actually it's a part of the whole open um, element but also a part of the whole open government the idea of, of open government uh, and I think open institutions also 
they give a certain um, possibility for transparency that we can see how how things how scientists come to their conclusions that is a very important part of um, of research and of science so i think opening up and giving more people access to see these things is an important step here peter do you have uh, yeah, I would add. something to add sure um, um and it's a great question uh you know, uh, the talk that I gave, uh, I titled The Fifth Estate, and um, I didn't say enough about why. The reason why is because I think that there's an extraordinary strength and power that exists in the knowledge sector um, that may, with, you know, the internet at its disposal, um, uh, be called upon like some kind of superhero to um, to um, match uh, the power or the unused power or the failed power of the first estate, the second estate, the third estate, and the fourth estate, which is the press. And so maybe the knowledge sector is, you know, all of the types of institutions that are gathered here today and that have been meeting for 10 years um, uh, has some power. Uh, extraordinary power, in fact, to publish more verifiable information online. So that's why I called it the fifth estate. Forgot to <laughs> forgot to say. It. Um, but the 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 second point I would make is, you know, in addition to your tenth uh, um, birthday here, happy birthday, at sharing is caring. It's also the tenth anniversary of this book, the new Renaissance, or this report that was sort of put out, um, uh, you know, overseen by a, 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 a team of three, um, I guess, uh, from, from France and Belgium and Germany, um, you know, calling for the digitization of all of cultural heritage. And it was kind of in reaction to that new Renaissance thing that um, I, I was, you know, trying to come up with something different called the new enlightenment. So uh, that call remains to be heeded, you know, um, the amount of money that's spent notwithstanding. So much information that's verifiable needs to be put out there so that people can recognize um, a lie when they see it. I think one of the things that um, we often tell ourselves in this sector is that it's not enough to just dump our open data out there. We need to follow that up with a different attitude in the world, in society. So do you agree with that? What's, what's the next step after actually opening up? Um, should I start out again? <laughs> so uh, I think the next step really now is to start tackling uh, some of the issues that I, I uh, talked about. So the first one about um, how do we, like, who's actually going to use this uh, open data, uh, not just outside of the institutions, but also very much inside the institutions, getting the whole institution involved in seeing the value uh, of this very expensive <laughs> digitization process also. But I also think that there is a very... Um, important challenge in in uh, in facing that fear uh, i noticed a tweet a bit earlier um mentioning that of course uh, peter's idea about uh, sharing is daring and also that the courage that is needed to share and i think unfortunately it it does require a lot of courage but unfortunately we also have a lot of fear surrounding sharing. I, I feel it every day <laughs> on my own person. Every time I put, uh, I, I use an image and I'm like, I'm double checking, am I sure? And especially because I'm talking about open <laughs> data all the time, I, I need to be sure and I need to double check and triple check. Um, and all of this causes me to feel doubtful. And when I feel doubtful, my creativity kind of <laughs> that takes a dive and I'm not able to yeah, to do the things that I, I think are fun and creative and, and to bring innovative uh, options to, to the world. 
So I think we need to really tackle this head on. Where does this fear come from and how can we work on it uh, together? Peter, do you want to chime in? Um, sure, and it's hard to follow that um, with anything meaningful, Henrietta. That was like, I agree completely with um, that. I mean, think of the fear today. Think of what poor Tyndall, you know, <laughs> felt, felt as he's being, you know, as he's galloping all around one one step ahead of Thomas More um, and Pope Clement back then. Um, I, I think that the penalties for failure are sort of less personally immediately severe in most of the countries we live in, but um, the rewards um, for success are huge. And maybe there is some collective approach to the history of medicine or the history of free elections or the history of some other stuff that is not to politicize anybody's work, but um, this is the thing, the very act of publishing a fact or a verifiable bit of information from a museum or a film and sound archive is just such a, is just such a bold step. It's just such an amazing thing. And the more metadata that goes with it and the more, the more, um, the more links that can go out with it and the more open it is so that if it can be published in Wikipedia, as the Digital Public Library of America has now somehow taken over the lead from some of these European organizations. How did that happen, you guys? Come on. Um, so I think I think that um, I think that uh, that courage needs to like we need to be reminded of the courage um, and uh, yeah, suppress the fear. Peter, you, uh, you talk about the promise of Wikipedia in an age of misinformation, but we also know that Wikipedia has had a reputation of information wars and diversity issues. Um, I, for one, work very closely with the Danish Wikimedia chapter and find it like extremely rewarding for our circle of GLAM institutions to um, publish and be active there. But I know that this is one of the fears for many GLAM institutions, um, these reputations. How can we, how can we help um, support an environment around the open encyclopedia um, to overcome these issues that are real tangible problems, of course, if it's primarily white males who, um, who publish on Wikipedia, um, and if there are great controversies about the truth, the representation of truth there. Yeah, white males are a problem. I can speak personally um, to that. Um, but I can say that Wikipedia is 20 years old, you know, um, and maybe like some other 20 year olds, it should have gotten its kinks out, but a lot of the 20 year olds we know, yeah. So I, I would say, you know, there's this great historian of the enlightenment, Robert Darnton, um, who's a real expert in the French enlightenment in particular, who has a new book out this year and who writes in it like, when the printed word first appeared in France around 1470, you know, the French didn't know what to do with it. Um, and I think, if we take a slightly longer view, you know, where we're not demanding instantaneous, you know, um, uh, yeah, an engine where we can, you know, plunk something down and immediately it's verified. Um, this is a process. And so I think the more institutions that commit to working with such a free uh, and community owned platform, and maybe reconsider their primary relationships with other publishers, uh, broadcasters who may not be public, uh, and and others. Um, I, I, you know, if we take a slightly longer term view, I think that um, that courage will also build because this is the direction that I think um, it's going, and that it needs to go, and that 
we need to push it in. Hmm. Henriette, um, I was wondering, in your book, you try to get cultural heritage professionals sort of woke about the potentials of digital tools, teach them to use and build on their own digitized collections, so to speak, get their hands dirty with their own greasy data and understand how difficult it is, as you also mentioned. How is this call to action received out there? I'm wondering if, if is, there an, is there an openness among like, people like me <laughs> to actually start learning how to code and program and um, understand these, um, yeah, the potentials in, in what we're actually opening up to the world here. I think, I think there is generally an openness towards the idea because it's very much in line, for many institutions, it's in line with this, um, this openness that I also sort of uh, explain in my book, this, this general openness that the institutions have been through the story of, of openness. So I think it's generally in line with this. And I don't think people are like, no, we don't want to share. I think some one of the big issues is probably a combination of um, not really seeing that there is any reason to share wider than sort of locally <laughs> with the group that they normally share with, but also fear to share wider because we all have one of the things the internet shows us very clearly uh, also with with these last uh, many divisive years on the internet uh, is that there are different sort of groups and cultures uh, around where when they get visible for everyone on the internet sometimes it's a shit show <laughs> and, and it goes uh it explodes in in, in all sorts of ways um but i think that uh so I think it's it's overcoming that both a fear or that everyone can now see what we're doing, not just this one school class that we have uh, at the museum, but it's also a need to see that there are people out there who are interested in it. But I think that is kind of people people tend to be okay with seeing that. The real issue comes, and and I get this from friends of mine who work in uh, institutions. <laughs> is how do how are we actually supposed to practically do this? Mm. Explain to us how out of a 37 hour week or however much <laughs> uh, time they spend at work, how are we actually going to do this practically? Mm. Well, and I think Wikipedia, like you just talked about, is a good example of this somewhere where with relatively little effort, it's not as difficult maybe as doing data science project with, with uh, JSON data and an API, with relatively little uh, effort, they can put some things online and then it can start snowball from there. Um, but I think that's where a bit of the issue is right now. <laughs> it's how are we actually supposed to do this? Hmm. Christina, you tapped yep. my shoulder. Yep. You have some questions from the participants. And thanks for letting all the questions roll in now. I'll try to keep up with it. We have Jakob Wang from the National Museum of Denmark. He asks, Peter, some people stopped or never started believing in our authority as truth validators, of course. Peter, how should we renew our role for it to work better? Um, yeah, I think, I think there are... Um, I think there are probably a couple approaches. One, at a you know, personal slash professional level is not to, not to waver in one's own role, one's own faith in the work that all of us, you, I mean, MIT um, is active in this. Uh, MIT Open Learning has a YouTube channel that is the largest .edu channel. We have 3 million just about 3 million subscribers for the courseware that we put out there. Um, that's pretty big. Uh, that means each time we publish something, millions of people get a chance to uh, see it. So don't waver. There's some, there's some um, um, 
strength inside that we need to tap. But the other is to think about maybe from a demand perspective, what are the issues out there that we, as the fifth estate, dare I, dare I like put that forward today, you know, um, we as the fifth estate should be addressing. Uh, if you're the fourth estate, the press, you're going to be figuring out what should go on the A1 column. Um, if you're a newspaper, you know, uh, front and center on the web. So what are the things that we should be organizing to address today? That's not to say that science and the humanities don't have their own serendipity and shouldn't be celebrated for by artists or by topic that's not necessarily newsworthy. But there are things that we can do to kind of root ourselves a little bit more deeply, maybe in the public imagination. And I think thinking about that as a collective, as this new stronger um, fifth branch um, in society is, is worth doing. Christina, you say the questions are really rolling in now, so yeah. um, please go ahead. It's hard to pick, but I found one for Henriette from Karen. The question is, I totally agree that we as institutions need to get better in understanding who is going to use our collections and why. Do you have any first-hand ideas or examples on how to start that research? Um. I do have some ideas, yes. I, I, um, I think that one of the, the most important things institutions can do is to try to find their, um, I call them different things, but, but their, uh, their amateurs, their ambassadors, their super interested users, people who already care greatly about whatever subject it is that the institution has. Uh, when we look at archives, which we do with the family history uh, um, online project, uh, we see family historians obviously are a group of users who care deeply about the material that is in archives. They really want to use it. Sometimes they use it daily. Sometimes we talk to people who use it far out into the night. They sit up and, and they look at, at heritage material, things that sometimes we we talk of as boring. <laughs> um, but they really care about this. I think I've also uh, previously talk, talked to uh, Marit a bit about sort of the, the art museum uh, and, and all the people out there who care about art, who do art in, in various ways. Um, and they, that they are maybe a group of people to, to contact and to figure out how could they actually use this, um, this material that we have at the art museum. Um, in terms of heritage museums, like in archeological museums, you have uh, people who are reenactors of various things. They have a great need for this information. So, so there are a lot of users out there who really deeply care about the material that is in, in institutions. So that is my, definitely my, my uh, suggestion contact them, figure out where they are. Do they have a Facebook group? What are they talking about in the Facebook group? What kind of information do they need? What kind of material do they need open access to? Um, and then, yeah, have a conversation with them. That is. I can advise you to, uh, to look in Henrietta's book because uh, it's really uh, all about practical hands-on, how to get started um, in uh, supporting communities better uh, as a heritage institution. I think we have time for one last question. Yeah, it's not uh, tagged on any of you, so I guess it's for both of you, from Saskia Skeltjens. She asks, we all know that the museum and technology world is not neutral in itself, open or not. So isn't the bias we find now in the data technology institutions the next big challenge too? Peter, you want to go first? Um, sure. Yeah, um, it's a great question. And I think there are um, biases, uh, biases. And, and it may be that by, you know, organizing Imagine organizing a, um, an exhibition 
um, that is entirely premiering, you know, in a museum when we all get back to museums physically and Wikipedia at the same time. Like imagine such a bold step, boom, um, you know, so that every image, every fact, every verifiable piece or almost every of it each is also being published into the commons at the same time. Guess what happens? I think it may be that white males, um, Trump had even more disparaging characterizations of people on their computers than that, if, if it's possible, um, you know, will continue to reinforce various biases. Uh, but it may also be that when something is in the commons, it will begin the process of kind of organic self-cleansing. Um, and so it may be that, you know, over the generations where it lives there, because it's generations, I think, that we need to think in time of, in terms of um, that bias will begin to, um, um, yeah, sort of disintegrate. Henriette, we're getting really close to our uh, break time. Do you have one last comment for this? Yes, I think it is something that we need to be very careful about. Uh, I'm not so sure I, I'm as optimistic, <laughs> maybe, that, that the biases will disappear. I think we definitely need to have a lot of focus on it uh, in order to, to um, um, yeah, to... to um, make that happen. I think one of the things that I, I also, that I really think is important here is also to remember when we do digital, uh, digitalize material and put it out there, that we are also creating a new historical <laughs> uh, construct. We are also creating, with Wikipedia, for example, we are also creating a new historical uh, element that is uh, a representation of the, the times we live in right now. Um, so it's important to think about ways in which we can have diverse uh, stories and narratives on there, but we need to we need to be active uh, in uh, in creating this. So to sum uh, up, sorry, time's running, but to sum <laughs> up, I'm hearing you say between the both of you that uh, it's somewhere between the commons and transparency about what we put into the commons mm -hmm. that some kind of way forward uh, is uh, paved out. Thank you very much. I had a million more questions for you. And there's uh, plenty of questions in the chat. If both of you feel like it, you can go in and just have conversations with um, your um, uh, listeners there. Um, we have a break now. Uh, you can stretch your legs, fill out up on coffee, and we'll be back at four o'clock for the Ignite session.
Welcome back. Hope you had a nice little break out there. Um, it's now time to welcome our first Ignite speakers. We have two sessions in this conference and the first one here today uh, we have dubbed Explorative Concepts because it's um, speakers who have been experimenting and exploring what open data can lead to in many uh, different forms, from projects to make young people more aware of democracy, climate change and open cultural heritage, to the use of artificial intelligence in playful and useful new ways. I'd like to give the floor to the four Ignite speakers. They are in consecutive flow. We play four videos, one after the other, and then we um, meet in a room for a chat with the Ignites afterwards. So please welcome first Alicia Peskowska, then Anne Mülich and Gerd Müller, then Andreas Refsko, and finally Jonas Schmidt. Hi, my name is Alicia Peskowska and I am here to present a project that was designed to promote open cultural resources available online. This project was a part of a larger campaign that I did for a digital culture think tank based in Poland. It took place over last summer and was financed by a grant from the European Union's Intellectual Property Office. And let me start <laughs> with the fact that even though there is tens of thousands of uh, works um, from public domain digitized and available online, it is very hard to measure people's overall engagement with these resources. Um, but what we do know uh, is that internet in its current shape and form is built in a way that does not encourage users to come across any valuable content online. And that is why when we were faced with the task to mainstream the knowledge about accessibility of online cultural resources and the freedom to use them, we have decided to experiment with the custom-made Instagram augmented reality filters. And a little bit of background about the project was that I took it over last spring when um, the pandemic was in full, in full sprung like it is kind of now and uh, we had to modify the project really fast to meet a very big KPIs our target audience was Generation Z and we were supposed to reach at least 80,000 of youngsters because the campaign was primarily designed to take part at the summer music festivals. But the music festivals were not taking place anymore and we didn't really have much resources to invest into huge paid collaborations. So we've decided to turn to Instagram because Gen Z uses Instagram very much and there is over 1 billion people engaging with Instagram per month and around four, 500 million that uh, watch stories every day. And uh, another thing was that the AR filters were just gaining a momentum and even though they were introduced in 2017 first, in 2019 Facebook used a special studio that allowed uh, users to create their own filters. And so we wanted to use that trend and uh, reach both people who would just play with the filters and just photograph themselves and friends, but also people who could potentially create filters and uh, yes, get creative with uh, public resources available online. And so we've invited um, two museums to take part in the project and one was the National Museum um, National Polish Museum based in Warsaw and the other one was the SMK, so the National Gallery in Denmark. Uh, they both have a huge following also on Instagram and we created these AR filters called Zero Waste Culture. And we've chosen two main paintings uh, to create the filters. The first one uh, was actually chosen by Merete Sanderhoff, who is one of the organizers of this conference and it was still live. And this is how it translated into the filter. And the second one was called Strange Garden and it's by Josef Mehofer, a Polish painter. Um, and you can also work yourself into it, into the scene that it portrays. And it came from the archives of the National Museum in Warsaw. And that is how the second one looked on Instagram. And you could use both filters, both like for selfies, but also to create shots of people, of other people around you. 
And our main results have been um, over 146,000 views of the filter and more than 12,000 of downloads. And it, it was just for the first two months of the campaign. And in addition to the filters getting viral and also being promoted by our different media partners and by the museums, we also hosted a workshop, an online workshop, where we were teaching people how to create their own AR filters using public domain materials. So the workshop uh, we hosted uh, had almost 40, 400 people attending. And do I think that everyone who came in touch with, uh, with the filters um, actually understood that they were made out of public domain resources and what paintings those were? I don't think so. I don't think people that easily would understand what, what open glam actually means, but I think this is important for museums to contribute to the quality of the online debate where it's actually happening and contribute to its aesthetics. And if you want to check the filters, please check out this link and use the Instagram app. If you want us to share it, please tag the Open Culture Studio. And if you want to read more about the campaign, there is a link for that as well. And if you want to keep in touch with me, you can follow me on Twitter or reach out to me to my email address. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody, to the presentation about our project, Living Democracy, an educational historical website dealing with the topic of working class children during the 1920s. I am Gerd, a software architect and open source lover located in Leipzig. And I'm Anna, an Europeanist, Slavonist and cultural enthusiast interested in digital and creative projects. In 2019, we started to collaborate with the Archive of the Workers' Youth Movement with the aim to create an educational tool dealing with the topic of the children's republics. The Archive of the Workers' Youth Movement collects, preserves and makes accessible about 4,000 shelf meters of photographs, testimonies, posters and records for more than 30 years. The Archive regularly publishes, essays and provides educational workshops. The data set contains about 300 images from several children's republics from the 1920s. The children's republics were democratically organized tent camps with up to 2,000 children under the roof of social democrat organizations. The project Living Democracy has been developed during the cultural hackathon Coding Da Vinci, which aims to bring together glams and developers as well as designers to prototype their ideas. The project won the prize for best design, and thanks to a three-month scholarship, we were able to continue our work by expanding the storylines and adding new features to the website. After looking through the dataset and reading additional text sources, I wrote a semi-fictional storyline. It includes many specific experiences and events like sports exercises, games and work duties, as you can see in those pictures. The storyline follows three working class children. By implementing moments of decision, the users can influence the path of the story and get different perspectives on the children's lives and their ways to the children's republic. During the process, we discovered and invented new stories which couldn't be covered with the help of the existing photographs. For this purpose, we created over 40 stop motion videos which we published under a Creative Commons license. The website allows the user to discover the living democracy with one of the three main characters, Carl, Gerda and Anna, who come from different regions. They are of different ages and have various backgrounds. The story gives a perspective on the experiences of the young participants as on the older or even adult helpers. At the end of some chapters, the chosen character can be changed. In the end, all three storylines melt into one. The website uses a scrolly telling approach, which means the user unfolds new parts of the story by slowly scrolling down the page, discovering text paragraphs, as well as videos, images and games. For the stop motion videos, we had the pleasure to get voice recordings from four different professional speakers. Additionally, friends of us recorded some socialist worker songs to enrich the background atmosphere. To motivate the users to stick to the story, we designed small games. Winning the game leads usually to the next chapter. For users unwilling to play, there's always an option to use a shortcut instead. 
Apart from that, the users can learn also about other people within the camp, for example, the doctor and the photographer. This is also a place where you can get to know enemies of the Children's Republic, like a Catholic priest or members of the Hitler Youth. Specific for this conference, we created an English version of Living Democracy, including subtitles for all our stop motion videos, which makes it accessible for an international audience interested in early participatory youth work. During the pandemic, the archive of the workers' youth movement is closed. So Living Democracy offers a glimpse of their collection. This digital service offers new possibilities for use. For example, the website can be used for historical workshops within the Socialist Falcon movement, which is strongly connected to the, to the archive of the Workers' Youth Movement. It can also be seen as an international inspiration for participatory youth work today. Start the adventure of Living Democracy by scanning the QR code with or without the dinosaur, and we hope you enjoy our project and have a nice time with Anna, Karl and Gerda. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Andreas Röskart and I'll be talking to you today about creating new cultural stories with AI. Um, before I start, just a bit about myself. I'm a programmer and interaction designer and digital artist um, doing a lot of artwork with machine learning and code. I also do public speaking, I teach a lot of workshops and I do freelance work with creative technologies, machine learning and code. Um, I'm going to show some uh, former projects of mine. This one is called Doodle Tunes, where I use AI to translate drawings of musical instruments into actual music. Um, I've also worked quite a lot with uh, face technologies, and in this project uh, called Eye Conductor, I translate uh, where people look uh, on a screen into music, enabling people who cannot play traditional instruments to play music. And then I also do a lot of silly stuff. <laughs> For instance, in this example, I control a game with very, very silly sounds. I teach the system how to recognize silly sounds. I've also made an online bookstore called Booked by AI, which sells science fiction novels that are generated by AI. Um, and you can actually buy these books. So if you don't like books that are written by real authors, you can try out my books. Okay, but today I'm going to talk mainly about two projects related to this topic, uh, Ogors Glass Platter Remixed and Enter the Art. These are two uh, projects I have made. Um, and Ogors Glass Platter is a collection of high resolution uh, photographies. And at a hackathon, I trained a StyleGAN model to generate new images. So I trained one that could generate new uh, people in the same style. Um, you see some of them up here. And once the model is trained, it can, infinite, it can generate an infinite number of uh, people, of images. And all of the images, they have um, biographies, the original images, and then I used a text generating model called GPT-2 to generate new biographies of the people that I generated. So people that don't exist will have new uh, biographies. So I want to kind of imagine how the lives of these people might have been. So this is one example um, where the text algorithm simply writes uh, a biography about uh, a person. So I'm, I'm dreaming about how they, their lives could have been. Then the second project is called Enter the Art. And this was a project I did in collaboration with uh, SMK, where the idea is that you, uh, as a person, can put yourself inside an art piece. Um, I use technology that can identify where a person is at uh, in a regular image, and then you place that image uh, you, or yourself on top of a well-known art piece. Um, and then I do a bit of uh, uh, masking. So you need to figure out where you place the person and then um, make a bigger mask. And then uh, AI technology can seamlessly 
put the two together as though you were in the original picture to begin with. Like so. And I've made a lot of uh, silly small experiments. Uh, so this is one of the skeins mailer and I placed uh, a little kid once uh, at one spot and the prime minister of Denmark in another spot. Um, and yeah, here you see me and the head of SMK and a random dude from the internet all placed uh, in the same image. I've actually also done it for some uh, PR work uh, for an upcoming book um, I have out, which deals with creative uses of technologies um, written together with Mass Corsgore. So yeah, that was my presentation. This was very fast. Feel free to reach out um, if you're interested in uh, this intersection between data, art and technology. Hello friends, great to see you. My name is Jonas and I'm here to introduce you to some very friendly robots. Now, first of all, please observe that the word art actually features in artificial intelligence. I'm sure there is a joke here and I, that I just can't see right now, but I'll let you think about it as I briefly run through our experience with machine learning. Now, one year ago, we launched the SMK online collection called SMK Open. And uh, thanks to everybody who has dropped by over this last year. As you can imagine, so much of the work goes on behind the scenes and you don't get credit for it. So it's great to actually do this today. One very important thing we've done is to stick our necks out a little bit. In its 125 years of existence, SMK has not gotten around to working with descriptive keywords for artworks. Zero. There's a ton of fascinating organizational reasons for why this is. But it's also just very expensive, time consuming and surprisingly controversial. A taxonomy isn't neutral, et cetera, et cetera. You know all this. What do we have here? Is it an angel? Is it a winged creature? Is it a mythological figure? Is it an example of superstition? It's just damn tricky and you're just afraid to get it wrong. And so sometimes you do nothing. The problem, of course, falls on regular, normal people. If you haven't studied art history, how are you going to navigate or explore a large art collection? You really need those descriptive nouns. And so in the SMK Open team, we took the liberty of sending every artwork photo we could get our hands on to a cloud-based image recognition service. And this service kindly dissects every image looking for objects in its enormous database. It's a dog, it's a flower, it's a tree, and so on. But we want more keywords. So we look up the hypernomic structure of those keywords from the cloud. So a pigeon is a bird and a bird is an animal. We include those as well, building our large keyword empire. We then translate these English terms into Danish. So bird becomes fool and so on. But we want more. Just to mention one more technique, we also look up the artwork in Wikidata and pull down keywords added by human editors from there. You get the idea. We do a lot of things to let clever machines or humans help us describe and thereby connect the art. Here's what happens when our friendly museum photographers add a new photo to the system. A number of processes start up automatically, enriching the information in our database. And it works. We actually do get lots of keywords. And there are a thousand footnotes here. 
but as a general principle, the more keywords, the better. And so everything is solved and our job is done. Not exactly. There are devils in the details and unfortunately, no lunch is entirely free, even those with robots. Let's take an example. How about Jesus? So we ship this scene to Microsoft Vision and what do we get back? Toddler. Now toddler is correct, but then a robot translates the term and we get buksetrol in Danish. And buksetrol is a very informal term for small child that corresponds to something more like rock rat. And honestly, rock rat is a slightly familiar way of describing the Messiah. And we have lots of paintings of the Messiah. Now the problem is paintings of cliff sites, rock formations, the machine sees rock, and this gets translated not to say clip in Danish, but into the Danish term for rock music. And if you add hyponyms from that starting point, it gets pretty wrong. Another issue is, um, you know, abstraction. The service is trained on photos. What's in this drawing? That may be hard for a machine to tell. And so the more abstract and the more modern, the lower the number and quality of the keywords. But while these are entirely important drawbacks and dissertations should surely be written about them, on the whole, I think we have contributed very significantly to making SMK's collection more accessible and more democratic. We thank our robot friends and we really do recommend letting them do as much of the work as possible so we humans can take care of the really hard and perhaps more meaningful work. So much to do. Thank you. Have a great conference and I hope to see all of you very soon. Thank you, Ignites. The history of sharing is caring runs parallel with the Danish cultural heritage hackathon, Hack for DK, that was instigated in 2012 by Jakob Wang and others. Jakob is also part of the team behind ShareCare21. We've been wanting to bring all of the energy from Hack for DK to the Ignite sessions of this Sharing is Caring celebration of usage. So now you've seen a small handful of examples of open cultural heritage being used in practice for education, community building, fun and innovation. We'd like to give you a chance to meet these practitioners and pick their brains. So that's why we now open a chat with the Ignites. So write your questions in the chat. Um, direct them at any of the Ignite speakers or at all of them, and uh, we'll help get them over to you guys. And while Christina um, monitors the chat, why don't I start with a question? Um, this is perhaps mostly for Andreas and Jonas. We've seen some playful sides of AI artificial intelligence, but how do you think we can cope with the darker sides of these technologies? Andreas, please. Oh, uh, that's a big, uh, big question. I think one step is to just like let more people get hands on with these technologies. Um, uh, and one thing that I really like about a project like um, um, hack for dk and also this project like from my side of things um, a lot of the uh, algorithms i use are actually open source but a lot of the data is hidden so the data is hidden on very few hands very large companies and i think it's very crucial that the general public has access to data and thereby they have also access to training their own algorithms and trying out what it means to train an algorithm and thereby also being able to figure out all the ways that things can go wrong. So openness in data is is a small step, but something that really helps, uh, in my opinion. I I have to agree, and then just to repeat the answer given earlier today, the 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 one of the answers is transparency, right? So the darker sides should be made lighter by just shining a light on what goes on beneath the hood and to just expose your, your algorithms, your techniques, your approaches, your aims, your goals, your data, all this stuff. The, the more it's accessible, the more it's verifiable, 
the probably the better. Um, this doesn't mean that there will be no biases. There will be lots of biases in, in every kind of system that we use. And there will be biases in the system that we call human beings as well. So there's biases all the way down and you shine a light on them and then it gets a little better. So I have a question also for, um, for Alicia and for Anna and Gerd. Um, the keynotes talked about it. You also talk about it. How do we make young people aware of and excited about open cultural heritage? What's in it for them? Um, okay, so maybe I'm going to go quickly first and then uh, get and I can follow. Uh, this is also a big question because it's not like there is one answer. We, I think we just have to be exploring the intersection of what they're interested in and what we can offer. Obviously, for like young people are also very creative and probably we cannot target all the young people. So we would have to get very specific in like what who, who is maybe already predisposed to interact uh, with uh, works of art. Yeah, I basically think you would have to like target different audiences and then in different ways because it all depends on their behaviors and where you can meet them with your with what you have. Um, so there's no one simple answer. It's all about understanding what you, yeah, who you want to work with and then just exploring how to do it best. So yeah, maybe a little vague, but I, I actually think there is no universal way. And it's constantly changing, especially online. But Alicia, you, uh, you made uh, a concerted effort to, uh, to do this. Uh, can you say maybe a little bit more about the reflections on how to actually reach out to this Gen Z? One other thing we did in the same project uh, that I presented about was that we actually worked with a youth climate strike. Um, and we wanted, we helped them make some videos about uh, drought uh, with the use of um, resources from the public domain. So we were just trying to target places where young people are active and where we can help. And in this way, make the resources we want to promote, promote relevant. So yeah, maybe that's one thing I would also recommend. Great. So Anna and Geert. You've been working on um, opening up the history of democracy to young people. Um, that's a big topic um, and to try and make young people interested and, and excited about something that feels maybe like school. Mm, I think I would at first also agree to what Alicia uh, said before. Um, I would say our case was also a bit similar because we had also a pretty defined target group. So uh, we had groups uh, from the Falcon movement, so uh, socialist, social democrat um, movement, which still exists and they still have youth groups and they are doing like the archive uh, from, uh, from which we got all the pictures. They also sometimes have groups for workshops in, yeah, in their place. So um, we had a clearly defined target group, let's say. I think in general, this is one of the bigger problems because there's so much stuff going on the internet that it's hard to put more and more uh, yeah, apps or website online without really knowing who you want to uh, offer to or who you really want to address. So I think this is, especially when it's uh, about young people, a really difficult point. Um, I also think we don't have a clear answer to that, uh, I'm afraid. So, um, yeah, I think also uh, how you did that, Alicia, that you have like a very specific group with whom you're working together, you know what they need, what they want, how they want to spread their yeah, data or their arts, whatever. Um, I think that works probably the best when you have already a group of people you are working with from the target group. Christina, I know that you have some questions from the audience now. Yes, let's see. We have one to Jonas from Saskia Skjeltjens. She asks, thank you for your presentation. How do you propose to involve the human review in your keyword universe? 
um, I would love to involve human users in my keyword universe. Just an example of, of one thing we've we've done since the, the example I described is, is our current project, which places SMK artworks on a map of, of Denmark. So all the motives are, are, are placed geographically. In that project, what we're doing is that we're, we're feeding data to, to an, an AI, if you will, to place the, uh, the, um, the artworks. And then we're asking people, mostly Danish people, to help us vet the locations, improve the locations. And there are amazing uh, sort of fountains of expertise out there, obviously, because people live in places, right? So they know about, they, they have really, really great knowledge about specific places in Denmark. So that's extremely helpful. I think that's that's that, that's a model that I really like. So we have the uh, museum data; it's improved by AI and further improved by humans, which I think is a kind of a, a, a great model. I didn't think of it before we did it, but now that I that I sort of say it out loud, I really like it. Uh, we haven't done that much on the online collection itself, but I think we should try to aim for that same model. So to just take the best of 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 all the different intelligences that are available to us. Thanks. And uh, Christina, I know there is another question. Yeah. This one is from for Andreas, I believe. It is from Jacob Wang, um, National Museum of Denmark. He writes, I love your projects. I'm a big fan of toying with things and ideas and having fun with them. What are your motivations behind your practice apart from having fun? Would you reflect a little on the sides of your practice that is serious? Sure. Um, so besides doing artistic work, I actually teach maybe 50% of my time or prepare for teaching uh, all over, uh, yeah, mainly Europe, um, teaching design students, also sometimes companies. And my motivation is actually to like start discussions from hands-on exercises with these tools. So I'm very interested in like one, what people kind of come up with once they're giving these, given these tools and also to what they think of these tools. So I like to like when I do workshops and I, I kind of lure people in with all the fun and all the silly and all the artistic stuff. But then on day three, we have discussions about bias and we have discussions about surveillance and we have discussions about capitalism um which is all inter interweaned um so so in a way that's my motivation like lure people in with the fun and then see what people think and and let's discuss these uh things because they're extremely important um, yeah, uh, I've, I'm personally very preoccupied with uh, these questions about artificial intelligence because uh, there's a lot of news coverage of yeah the darker sides. I'm, I'm still wondering, um, do you have some ideas or you know thoughts on what glams should be most wary of when it comes to? you know, playing with or integrating uh, artificial intelligence in uh, the work we do with our collections, with our assets. This goes out to all of you. I mean, feel free. Well, I would just um, to start, uh, first of all, I think, uh, it's, it's very broad to talk about AI in general. Every project will have its own specific biases, specific, specific problems, specific details that are very important uh, to touch upon. But I think, I mean, one sort of danger, of course, is to, is to, um, is to invite all these uh, systems and services in and then just blame somebody else for their problems, which is kind of maybe what I'm sometimes doing with, with my whole Microsoft vision says this, and is, isn't it funny? It's, it is funny uh, to a degree, but it's also our responsibility to make sure that it doesn't sort of sort of dirty, uh, make the data more dirty than it has to be. So, so I think we, the, the, the stuff that we subscribe to, the stuff that we invite in has to be, has to meet requirements that we set 
this is not a sort of get out of jail free card and just add keywords at at random. So I think that that that, that has to be sort of observed when we do this. Anyone else who uh, I, it doesn't have to be as a like hands on project leader, but also just as a, a glam professional in the day and age of artificial intelligence. What are your thoughts on these technologies um, in a field where we used to, you know, we're the humanities? There's kind of a, an interesting co uh, collision going on here. Um, I actually have a good uh, friend, a colleague who is working at the Copenhagen University with um, AI and ethical AI. And I think uh, what they advocate mainly for is to try to diversify the teams that are working on AI and then on the other hand, just educate people about how, um, how different systems work. I don't know, just like inviting diverse groups of people to verify the keywords that the AI came up with so that the way they correct is also a little bit challenged because it's also, you know, of course, negated by personal biases. So I think kind of introducing a diverse groups of people to interact with it um, and demystify um, the way it works can help. Um, there was a comment from Andrew Smith uh, saying, I wonder if just having fun is not enough valued by GLAMS. Maybe a comment to Jakob's uh, <laughs> question to you, uh, Andreas. What do you say to that? Maybe, I don't know, maybe having fun is, is a good start. Like I, there's nothing wrong with fun, but I think fun is a, is a nice opener and it involves, like it gets a lot of people interested and then maybe some will like to dig even deeper and that's great. And for some, it was just fun for 10 minutes or an hour. So I have no problem with superficial fun, but I have like, uh, um, yeah, I have uh, other, like I, I use them as techniques to get people interested, but there's nothing fun, wrong with fun in itself. I don't know if I understood the question. Totally, it was a, it was a comment really. Um, um, I'm thinking about um, your projects, um, Anne and Gerd and, um, and Alicia, uh, reaching out to uh, young audiences, young users, because um, it's one of the big, um, mysteries, I think, for um, for the glam sector is how to build lasting relations with uh, next generation users. Uh, we know we know the the people who use museums, galleries, and uh, libraries and archives, our own age, and with our own the the interests we share. We know that kind of audience really well. But when it comes to next generations, we often feel that, hmm, how do we actually grasp their attention and, uh, and really create um, appealing, compelling um, experiences for and with them? I was just wondering if you can reflect a bit on what kind of relation you built with the young people um, in your target groups um, and how you maintain them. Maybe Anna and Gia, do you want to go first? Okay, and then I would like to start. I think uh, just to uh, go back um, what Andrea said, I think fun is a very good opener even to have a connection with uh, the generation set. So in our um, prospect, on our um, project, we uh, try to use a playful experience. So getting hands on not only with the uh, images of the archives, but uh, with some uh, cute, characters like uh, choosing a character, being bonded to this character, going all the way down of uh, living in um, living in a camp with this specific character could be one way to have a better connection with um, the younger target group. So this was our purpose to uh, use Use the fun part, use the uh, images, the videos, also some small games to keep them entertained. But on the other hand, also use some background information, use images of those times to uh, reflect the, um, the times uh, in the beginning of the last century. 
And and how did that? Um, I mean, how do you how do you then maintain your relationship with with the people who who use that resource? Hmm. Um, I think this is probably a part where we would like to uh, strengthen those connections. So in the first parts, there was some feedback rounds and feedback loops with uh, the target groups about their perspective, about what they liked about it. Um, the archive gives some uh, adding to it, like adding some more um, characters and more story points, but definitely um, evolving and extending it to social media platforms could be a way, but we are, with the contact of the archive um, of the workers' movement, we are in contact to improve this uh, connection with our target group. But we've definitely um, established that uh, these young generations also just are known for being very creative and very actionable. So um, I'm sure they also have ideas themselves uh, where they want to take this project that you started. And Alicia, I'm, I, I gather that you have some of the same experiences? Mm, I would maybe open with something a little controversial. I'm not sure if you can actually, within a project, build sustainable relationships with anyone. So I would rather target people who already have like some existing structures uh, within which they function so that, you know, you cannot promise something sustainable if you don't have resources to, <clears throat> to actually deliver on that. And I think most of our work is project based. So if you represent a cultural institution that you can see, you know, if you have an education unit, maybe this is where you invest, but you cannot really um, build a sustainable relationship with an audience just through one project. Um, and I think over promising can can harm you in long term. Um, so I think that this is tricky, but I would rather invest where where these people already are and gather and where you can collaborate and partner with a structure that can um, that can work with this interest, um, which probably would mean contributing to the mission of, you know, whatever you're going to collaborate with. Is it a school? Is it a club? Um, but so that's my one tip. And another one is to, you know, use a little bit of design thinking. So just have focus groups and just like test with people uh, what they're into and not assume. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. I think it's a really, really important point you're making that uh, a lot of the good intentions and ideas that are floating around in terms of making ourselves relevant and reaching out uh, are sometimes hampered by the fact that uh, it's just understaffed, under-resourced. So thank you for bringing that up, Alicia. Um, we're getting close to uh, actually rounding off this uh, session and um, Christina, uh, you, uh, you have some comments from uh, the I chat. Could just, I could just see that there's a whole lot of uh, ping pong going on regarding playfulness mm -hmm. as a thing that we as an institution might try to add to the way we engage with our users and audience. Playfulness, fun, mm -hmm. keeps on going on the chat as a thing that mm. we might not have been giving enough, uh, enough attention. Yeah, I think we're a very serious business <laughs> a lot of the time. So uh, it's that's been a that's been a good um, a good cue for us uh, to uh, to be more playful, um, and uh, it's um, it's characteristic that it comes from <laughs> from uh, people outside who want to do something with. Uh, with our collections, with our resources, um, it's it's actually that's that's a really uh, that's really been a guiding thought for uh, for this community for many years. I think to uh, to actually listen to what people want to use us for and not be afraid that um, <laughs> they want to do something crazy. <laughs> um, I'd like to just briefly uh, and in conclusion get back to. Um, the artificial intelligence um, question and uh, just ask uh, around the table here, if we can call it a table, what do you think are the most promising prospects of these new technologies? Andreas, maybe you want to go first? 
and I mean for you know for the for cultural heritage for getting it um, out there, no, not no, no. in totally general terms. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I think. So I think in, in like these Ignite talks, we've seen examples of them, right? So, so, so machine learning can like, it can classify and it can generate. And by classifying, you can have, like you can, some of the tasks that would be extremely expensive, or almost impossible, AI can help you with those tasks, like figuring out what's what. Um, and then they can also be used to help you come up with new things like synthesize things or like do things that you wouldn't normally be able to do like some of the examples that i've done where i kind of position people and have them be painted in the style and that's not something you can kind of uh, just instruct a computer to do it's something that it can only learn from having seen tons and tons of examples of for instance painting so there's this whole the more kind of data uh, you release as institutions the and the better these uh, algorithms get then the more interesting at least from my perspective artistic outcomes can we see um so yeah there's both like you can save a lot of money you can automate stuff and you can also have expressive outputs that would be hard to even imagine without ai so the robots actually inspire the humans who wants to uh, go next jonas I would just, just to, to, to touch on the very pragmatic and boring side of what you just said, Andreas. Uh, speaking of playfulness and uh, whether or not we're pro-fun, I think we are pro-fun and I want my workday to be fun and playful as well. Uh, and uh, that means somebody else should take care of all the boring stuff. And I think machines are excellent uh, for doing all the boring stuff. They don't get bored very much. So why not just use AI to just clean up to connect to connect things just analyze all the tons of data that we have that we have stored away i think that's a that, that's a fine use for um for uh for computers and um, and robots that would enable us to do more playful meaningful uh, and so on work and i'm not afraid of that kind of ai at all i don't necessarily share the skepticism except for of course just remembering that nothing is neutral <laughs> machines aren't neutral humans aren't neutral there's nothing neutral uh anywhere so uh keep that in mind and just let the machines sort out stuff hmm. and then Gert, do you have a concluding remark i think i would totally agree what jonas said uh let let robots and let ai do the boring stuff and uh let us as humans do all the social creative fun stuff so um I think the best way for working with artificial intelligence is connecting all the dots with all the missing resources that we have, and then use this, we as developers, as artists, uh, and also as um, people who would like to uh, use websites and all the apps which are created, use this uh, and do something social connected fun way out of it. Thanks. Alicia. Do you have a famous last word for us? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not going to say anything new. I also agree with Jonas. I um, I think that AI is good to do things like at scale, like solve. Um, we kind of formulate the question and the task, and then it can help us do things at scale and a lot faster. And uh, if we just uh, treat it um, as what it is, then we're going to be fine. We just have to kind of understand what kind of a tool that is and what it cannot help us with. Maybe coming back to Peter's remark in the keynotes and conversation um, about Wikipedia only being 20 years old, we should probably also keep that in mind when uh, we uh, look at and sometimes shiver a little bit over um, artificial intelligence. Thank you very much, Ignite speakers. It was uh, great to have you here. We'd have loved to hang out with you <laughs> in a more sort of informal live way with a beer in our hand and uh, <laughs> but uh, this is also great um, when uh, the other thing can't happen right now um, and what's also wonderful is that um, we'll have a chance to uh, do some more sociable uh, hanging out tonight 
We'll get back to that in a minute. Right now, we'd uh, just like to wrap up. Um, yep. by, we won't bore you with a big summary of today's <laughs> <laughs> learnings, <laughs> but we would like to uh, just briefly uh, go over the program for tomorrow. So, um, we have two more keynotes tomorrow, uh, and we kick off the day with uh, those. It's uh, Kati Hüppe um, and Susanna Stanska, um, who will also open up stories of amazing, surprising usage of uh, open cultural heritage. Um, the next thing after the keynote is a conversation. Um, and then after the break, we have the Share yeah, Care yeah. 10, 10 year, year anniversary quiz. quiz. <laughs> and you can will win some cool prizes. Do you oh, want to show them yeah, maybe? Sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll do that. Because we have like, uh, this is third place. It's a small, uh, what's it called? Music, Music box. box. With an uh, artwork yeah, on Yeah, of, of course, with the SMK artwork. And we also have a, a bag here with an SMK artwork. Yeah. Hammershoi. And for first, first right. they get this. It's a puzzle with the SMK artwork. It's a big one. Yeah. And um, you need to. We'll be playing tomorrow, and uh, we uh, hope it will be fun. And um, it will be uh, a good idea to uh, maybe study some open glam history tonight if you want to play. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Hint>. <laughs> After the quiz, um, we uh, continue with um, the Ignite session number two. Um, and um, this time it's going to be about new best practices. So where these new ideas that are fostered uh, outside and inside the GLAM community actually turn into uh, sustainable ways of working in new ways. Uh, there'll be a chat with the Ignites like today. And then we actually um, wrap up the conference uh, in a conversation with uh, George Oates, uh, live with us from Australia. Um, around uh, the history of Open Glam, looking back and also looking ahead at new frontiers. And then, importantly, uh, as we mentioned in the introduction, um, community members have uh, dreamed up um, another dimension to this conference, uh, a social meetup, uh, which takes place first tonight at um, 8 o'clock, um, CET, um, and again tomorrow when we end the conference, it's, as I, we've mentioned, Larissa Borg and Saskia Skelchens, um, who came up with the idea to uh, open a room at Wonder Me for all of us to meet. Um, it's really simple. Um, we've shared a link to um, the Wonder Me room uh, by email this morning, um, but if you don't have it, let me know. Uh, you can just uh, DM me on, um, on Twitter or Larissa or Saskia will help you. Um, and uh, you don't need a password or anything. You just join uh, from the direct link. And Saskia and Larissa will uh, host and facilitate um, a hangout there um, where we can digest and discuss what we've um, been hearing today. So I hope that many of you have time to stop by and, um, you know, bring a beer <laughs> and, um, and hang out. Yeah. Yeah. And also maybe, uh, especially the Ignites, look a big, bit back in the chat because I can see there are some personal stuff for you. Mm -hmm. um, a whole lot of things going on. So maybe check it out. There yeah. might be some mail. <laughs> Cool. Um, so I hope yes, I, we see you tonight or tomorrow on Vimeo. And um, you'll enter the live stream tomorrow from the Sharing is Caring website, where we'll post a fresh link for the conference live stream tomorrow. So um, with that, yeah. I think it's over and out from SMK Copenhagen.
it's been fun to uh, be in this virtual room with you and we look forward to see you again tomorrow. Bye. Bye.